Because we don't have a live streaming for the people around the world. Right. The IP is working. Ah, uh -huh. so I gotta put on my Bali face. <laughs> Shut up and take a deep breath, Ida. Three times. I'm actually looking forward to that commentary. You've got to rearrange it just right, don't you? Get all in there. Yeah, I did. 
I was just going to pull that a um, couple of things to follow. But it's kind of like a good thing. It's close to what we have. And it's nice. Um, is the School in Phoenix, Arizona, and those who are watching literally around the world from this uh, webcast, we're delighted to welcome you to our second Cronkite Global Conversations for the 2019 year. There's a little bit of sparkle in the air because it's Valentine's here in the United States tomorrow and celebrated not just America, but lots of places. So we're going to fall in love with storytelling today. We're going to do that in a unique way with two of our amazing current uh, Humphrey Fellows. The Humphrey Fellow Program um, is a part of the Cronkite School for the last nine years, where we've hosted some 90 journalists and public relations professionals from around the world. And we're excited to have another group this year. Valentine's Day is tomorrow, and love and friendship is what this program really is all about, as they try to understand leadership principles and current trends and technologies in media platforms that they can affect in their own country. And they go home and make impact. And you'll see when our two speakers today speak with us, the kinds of impacts that they have had individually in China and South Africa, and the potential for the impact that they will have around the world. Hubert Humphrey said, what you do, what each of us does, has an effect on the country, the state, the nation, and the world. And we're grateful to have uh, our fellows with us. The Humphrey program would not be possible without the United States State Department, the Institute of International Education, which uh, coordinates the program out of Washington, D.C., and not without many of the people in this room who are host families, faculty mentors, fellow classmates, <laughs> and just friends in the greater Phoenix community, and broadly, as people watch on the webinar. So it's a group of concentric circles that help the Humphrey Fellow get lifted up to go to their next level of leadership and opportunity. This series of Frankheit Global Conversations today uh, sparkling global change through storytelling will continue throughout the month of February. So, without further ado, I would like to introduce our two speakers today, and I'm looking to see because I'm not sure who's going first. I think it's Jin Jin from the Great Global Nation of China, who is a fantastic filmmaker. And those of us getting ready to watch the Oscars on the 24th of February someday, we'll see Jin Jin up there accepting her Oscar. Oh, so please. <laughs> Is 
So thank you for coming. I'm Jingjing Mo from China as a filmmaker. And this is another speaker, Simon Zhu from South Africa. Today we want to discuss about the sparking global change through the storytelling. So first, why we want to do this topic? It's because we strongly believe that a story we're told can change the world. But what's the strategy? We will tell the stories with the issues which are shaping our world. And then we will invite the audience to get engaged. So let's start with the video storytelling in China. Um, first of all, when I think about this topic, I ask myself, the first question is that, why story, video storytelling is important in China? So I want to start with a clip. It's from a Chinese documentary. So who is controlling the phone? The, yeah, the, no, someone is controlling the, the computer. Oh, Chris. Can you stop it? Mm, hold on. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, no, I cannot. Okay, I can control you now. But it's okay. So <laughs> I will remind you again is that why video storytelling is important in China. I want to show you this clip. First, I'm so sorry. Uh, can you just stop controlling this? It's, it's from the IT room. They don't have to finish it with the screening. So sorry for everybody. That's I'm so sorry. sorry. No. Okay, okay. It's literally the IT. Uh, can you hold in and stop it? So I wish you can go out this time. Is it it's a clip from a Chinese documentary. Chinese <音>你见过真正的星星吗 so this clip is from a Chinese citizen's documentary called Under the Moon. It's a documentary which focuses on the air pollution in China. So it's an online release because it's very difficult for documentaries to be released in China's theater. So that's the only one way for her to release this movie. So let's image what's the impact of this documentary. Within the first 48 hours, the video playback amount was 200 million chunks. And then a large number of those audience, they expressed their great support for this documentary. And more than 80% viewers, they concerned about the air pollution in China. And 70% viewers, they changed their mind about the air pollution. Maybe before that, they never realized that it should be a, such a big deal. And over 75% viewers, they wanted to restrict the car and take public transportation. And some viewers, they begin to give up some comments online and say it should be someone or some government department. They should take responsible for it. So what's going on next? The fifth step, this video and all the articles were deleted. So that means in China, we cannot see it now. So the video, I got it from the YouTube, but in China, we cannot use YouTube. So I think the Chinese government, they cannot delete it in America. Why I want to mention this case, because I want to point out three important things. First, from the playback amount, we can see the audience is very huge and the video market in China is already very huge and mature. 
The second thing is we can see the social impacts from video storytelling. And the third thing is unfortunately, we are not only facing the new censorship, but we are also facing the filmmaking censorship in China. I will discuss much more details in the following class. So let's go back to look around what's the current situation of the video production in China. There are something it's improving. First one is the online video users. If during the past 10 years, based on this graph, we can see it was increasing very fast. In the end of last year, it reached almost, uh, it reached more than 600 million. And then it occupied 76% of the internet users. Another trend is the short video application users is increasing. So I'm not sure maybe anyone who have ever played the short video application before? No. Okay, such as the TikTok. This one is the most popular one in America last year, and it's from China. In China, we call it Douyin. So what's short video application? It's such kind of application. You can upload whatever videos you want. So everyone can be the producer. And the time limited, most of the time is less than 90 seconds. So it's short video. There's a very funny part of this users is 80%, we can see the second one, 80% of the users, they are under 30. So that means that's a huge but young population in China. And the third trend is about the Chinese box office. We became the second place last year and we reached almost 9 million US dollars. And the first place is still the North America. So let's look at this graph. We can see the blue line is the North American share of global box office, and the orange line is China's. We can see that during the past 40 years, the North American share is foreign down, and the China's is increasing very fast. So our film, filmmaking marketing is increasing. So after reviewing such kind of improvements, we had to face our real life. So what's the challenges we are facing in China? First, it's the film censorship just as I mentioned in the beginning of from the documentary. Um, the second one is the shortage of realistic movies. Maybe you already know so many social issues about China, but maybe just from the news reports, not from filmmakings, because we don't really have such kind of movies so many. And the third one is, it's very difficult for documentaries to get released in the theater. We can admit, Maybe one year we can only see 13, one, three documentaries in the theater during the whole China. So it's a very limited number. And the obsession with superstars, because most of the filmmaking production companies, they prefer to pick up the superstars, the singers, to be the actors in the movie, because they think we can earn much more money from their fans. Oh, I'm so sorry. And the last but not least is the is that the entertainment of the short video. So we we'll on to the another part is how to impact China with better video stories. First, mm. we should try our best to find a balance between the real and fiction. Because we need much more movies based on real life events. It's not only for documentaries, but also for the fiction movies. Because in China, we are facing, with that, we are undergoing a lot of great changes, and a lot of social conflicts is emerging. But sometimes it's very difficult for us to do it in the news. So that means we can say more because we have rich resources of such kind of social issues. And we should say more. Let's look at this poster. It's from a Chinese documentary, it called Plastic China. And it got the uh, two years ago special mention award in Sundance Film Festival. So it should be a good movie. So this is about the plastic wetness problem in China. And this girl is only 11 years old. She cannot go to school because her family is, is very poor. Um, all her family, family is living on resolving a lot of plastic wetness every day, every day. So her body is not so healthy. But as I mentioned, it's a good movie. It got a lot of awards during the whole world, but it's popular in China. So we are facing the same problem. Now, documentaries has is limited. How can we tell much more stories if we still want to do it? Maybe we can try to make some fiction movies. 
And this is the most important movie last year in China. It called Dying to Survive. And it's a story about some cancer, cancer patients in China. And this story's main character is the first one, who is a small businessman in the beginning. The story is focused on how this small businessman became a Eastern selling agent of cheap Indian anti-cancer drugs in China. So this story, this movie is based on the real story from Lu Yu, who is also a cancer patient before. So let's mm -hmm. look at the profit of this movie. It's, it became the third in China's box office in last year, and it got the highest rated movie in China last year too. So we can see the investment is less than 9 million. It's not the large number. But we can see the boss office is 15 times much more. This is the real character, Lu Yu. So let's look at the impact of this movie. After one week, this movie is released. Our Chinese premier, Li Keqiang, he made some requirements. He required the reality departments. They should load their cancer jobs and extend it into the public medical insurance system. And in the end of last year, that means almost six months after this movie, there's a big news. 70 kinds of price cutting anti-cancer drugs, they are officially included into the public medical insurance catalog. So why I mentioned this case, is not only want to show off or how successful, how successful it is, is I want to say, is how important such kind of movie it is. In China, we need much more movies in this way. So let's, Let's explore much more possibilities between the sense and sensibility. Because we always say making a movie is an artist's job and it should be very sensibility. But now something changed. The big data became to involve in the video production. So that means maybe before, as a filmmaker, you are focused on what you want to say. But now maybe you have to pay attention to what audience they want to listen. So based on such type of data, you can analyze the story elements from some successful movies. And you can analyze what's the hot topics. Maybe you can from the uh, news reporting. You can analyze the audience favorites, playback, pauses. From the online video, it's, it's very easy for you to get such data. So with, with these data, maybe you can produce much more good movies. But we have to pay attention to that. We cannot always just believe in the data. We have to make a decision by ourselves. If the data can work everything, that means the computer, they can do everything, of course not. And the third part is, have you ever imaged that one day when you're watching movie, just like you're playing the games? Because we have VR movie now, we have VR theater. So what's VR? It's virtual reality. In 2017, China built its first VR theater. So let's talk about much more about what's VR. So we are movies for men. Uh, is anyone watch this movie last year? Ready, pray one. <laughs> no, okay, the American hot movie in China. <laughs> um, there are three formats about such kind of VR movies. First one is 360 degree videos. That means you can see everywhere you want, even your bed. <laughs> and the second one is the limited interaction of VR movies. When you are watching such kind of movies, you can decide what's the story going on. You can choose some options. So the audience can get much more engaged experience. They are feel much more involved in this story. So the last one, I think it should be the most powerful one. is the full body immersive VR movies. Because when we are watching the traditional movies, we can see, we can hear, but now we can touch, we can smell, just like we are living in our real life. So we have already talked about so many information about movies. So what's the advantages of these movies? Why we have to pay attention to it? First is the authentic, that is real. The second one is immersive. The first two points is very important for documentary productions. Because when we are producing documentaries, we are always saying, oh, we are we're telling real stories. We want you engage much more. We want you feel much more. Now we have real documentaries. That means you can immerse yourself much more into this story. You can feel much more. And the third one is the interactive. I feel everyone wants to interact with the stories. They don't want to just stand very stand by in the, in the chair now. 
And the last one is the impact photo. Let's look at this, this photo. It's from last year's Sundance Film Festival. So now VR movie is not only something we just talk about in the classroom or something like that or from the book. Even in such kind of good film festival, Sundance Film Festival, they open a small union for this kind of movie. They show it. So I believe that it would be, become a big change in the future of film production. Maybe it's still spend much more time, but it would be. So last but not least, everyone becomes storyteller now. We are producer and we are audience. Maybe before such kind, uh, the mobiles popular, um, the short video applications everywhere. It looks like they are very strict and high standards for everyone to become a filmmaker. It's very difficult for you to make a video, but now not. If you have a mobile phone, you can download such kind of application. You can make what kind of videos as you like. You can be director, you can be producer, you can whatever you want. Mm -hmm. So in China, we can look at this number. The mobile internet users is more than 700 million. And the short videos in recent three years become very popular in China. Those videos, they are mostly between 10 to 90 seconds because much more young people, they don't really have much more, uh, have many patience to sit down at the table <laughs> and listen to it one hour or two hours. No, they just want to keep, keep breathing, breathing this way. So those videos become very hot. So that's this, I will give you one example. It's called TikTok. It's from China, but it became the most popular short video aggregation uh, in America last year. So maybe some young guys, they play it. There are some funny information is that 85% of the users, they are under 24 years old. A monthly activity users are over 400 million. And those numbers are only in China. So can you image what's the number during the whole world? It should be much more huge. So maybe you are wondering what the TikTok looks like. Let me show you some examples. Mm -hmm. So that's the ordinary video format of this application. In the beginning, it's just used for the music. So some of you prefer singing, you can make such videos. But later, the audience is pro much more possibilities by ourselves. Let's look at the second one. I was standing on the road, I was waiting you to hold, of color I don't know. So it's a lot of amazing moments always happen around here. So we can share, but if we just talk, they cannot image. So maybe some when after that you can download this application. Um, I want to emphasize the last one. This is very special. It's not by from the ordinary people. It's made by the policeman station. That's amazing. Maybe before that, it's unbelievable for me to image the Chinese politician. They will do this. I don't think so because they are so straight. They are so far away from me. And I just don't want to talk with them. I don't want to listen to anything from them. But they made this movie and this movie, this clip is very popular in China. This video is the Chengdu police. They want to remind you, take care of your property. Because uh, one way ago is the Chinese Lula New Year, everyone is returning home, so they made this one. So I want to say it's now it's not only Chinese government using this application, but also some newsroom they are beginning to use this one because just as I say, 
the future is young people, but the young people, they don't stay and listen to a lot of a long time. So they prefer to use this one. So the storytelling ways is changing in China a lot. I have to say there are still something bad from this application because it's it just like you kill time. If you look at the first one, the second one just kill your time, exactly. But if sometimes for the newsroom or the government, they can express their opinions much more, they can try this way. So in the end of, of my part, I want to say, even though the technology and the media format is changing very fast, but I always believe that only the good content can win. So with the good content, we can reach much more audience. Uh, when we reach much more audience, we can get much more impact. Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So we'll take a couple of questions if you have about China, and then we'll move to South Africa with somebody. Who's got a question for Jin Jin? I'm a, how many of you have TikTok downloaded? That's my question. <laughs> yeah, I, do I have it downloaded. How many of you actually use it? <laughs> Are you admitting it? Good. Okay, so questions. Let's start here. So I want to go back to that slide you had about the box office. Was that general <laughs> box office, theatrical box office releases, or was that just for documentaries? Because I see it's declining in the U.S. Oh, do you mean the first clip? No, the slide no, graphic about box office numbers. The box, oh, okay. Yeah, that one. This one. Yeah, so is that general box office or is that just documentaries? Because uh, I see it's declining in the United States. Sure. I think it's, it's including all. All? Yes, including yeah, all. Yeah, okay. It's about a share, it's not the yeah, number, it's number. It's not the amount. Gotcha. Yes. Other questions? Good one. Yes, sir. Not that the U.S. is doing so great right now. <laughs> uh, how would your government feel about you putting on this presentation? And you don't have to answer that if you don't want to. No, no, I can answer you. I mean, it's, I also made some documentaries and the result just as this one. <laughs> so that means sometimes my opinion, my voice also cannot be released. Uh, I think so, maybe they don't want to see that, but that's my right. And that's what the Chinese audience, they don't want to see. We have our duties to share much more stories if we are journalists. And then we'll go both of you back there. Have you seen any potential for um, people actually using TikTok for documentary content that might otherwise be um, censored? Something, some short form, kind of like the documentary that you showed? Has, mm -hmm. has anybody kind of started doing that in China with TikTok, or is it still mostly fun? Entertainment. I just say that I'm so sorry. It's most of the time just for fun. You know? oh. <laughs> so, but I think so. That's why I say I still feel, feel fear about such kind of popular because you have some problems inside. But I wish, if possible, we can do something. <laughs> okay. okay I would just be interested in anything you could say about the state of search in China, discoverability, uh, search. How search works in China. Being able to discover things. Oh, sorry, I cannot hear the first part. Search, like searching on Google, although you don't have access to Google. But so, how do you uh, how do you search? How do Chinese yeah, search yeah. for things? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so yeah. we have two solutions. First one, just give up. <laughs> you know, <laughs> just say, okay, fine, I'm done with everything. Chinese government, you you are your brother, you are a big guy. Then the second one is what I did. It's we buy the VPN. It's a specific software, and with this software, we can. We can use the YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Google, Gmail. And those things, I, what I mentioned about is what we cannot use in China. So maybe several months later, I will disappear. But don't worry, I'm not that. No. <laughs> Just maybe my baby is not working. <laughs> Other questions? Yes, well, speaking about censorship, if those videos are taken down, depending on the parameters, are there any other associated penalties with getting censored or getting your video taken down, for instance, by the government? And your question is about who can take off the videos. Are there any associated penalties if your video is pulled off the internet? I don't think we will really get some. If it's this level's documentary, you will not get punishment. But if you say something much more directly and straightly towards the government, maybe you will. Some 
some government, some department, they will invite you to have a tea or have a coffee. Mm -hmm. So you can image what the result. Mm -hmm. But this guy is still OK. But just delay it. One last cookies? question for Jinjin. Jin. Do they offer cookies? <laughs> I wish. <laughs> All right, thank you very much again. Thank you. So we'll go hot scratching the globe next to uh, the land of Africa, seven zero. <clears throat> You see her background, by the way, both in this document, and if you didn't receive one, there's in front of you the biographies of all of the current Humphrey Fellows in this two-page uh, handout that's here. You can understand their unique background, including Seven Zealy's very successful background as a radio journalist, among other things. In South Africa. Brilliant. Good afternoon. How are you guys doing? Good. Good. Great. Thank you very much to my colleague um, Jin Jin for doing a fantastic job. I want to talk about how you and I are storytellers and at any given moment we are continuously telling stories. Now marketers will tell you this, maybe not for free, but they've managed for time immemorial to make a ton of money for companies, for example, who are producers of products and materials that you and I choose on a daily basis to associate ourselves with, to identify with, because they complement in some form the stories that we own and tell about ourselves. So we not only tell stories about ourselves from what we share with people, with, you know, through verbal communication, or oral um, communication, or through written form, but we also tell stories by the choices that we make. So, Chucks, I'm wearing a pair today. You go anywhere in the world, you will see several people wearing a design or this, perhaps this particular design um, or, or a slightly different one, but you see people wearing this particular brand. They may have never heard of Chuck Taylor before. They may never understand or know the association of basketball. All they know is that this is a cool, funky brand. And when I own it, I'm seen or perceived to be that way. The dirtier the pair, you seem to be perhaps more conscious, more woke, more deep. It sometimes is a little nasty though, particularly if you're wearing a white pair. But nonetheless, this is how, this is how people express themselves. Hair is a very significant symbol, a very significant story um, uh, teller. How you wear it, how you let it down, how you let it flip to the side on a Friday night, depending on your mood, where I come from in the world. When we cover up our hair, we usually do so uh, as a sign of respect um, for religious purposes, women are genuinely encouraged to cover their hair. And of course, religiously across the globe, um, women in general also are expected to cover their hair. Shades, sunglasses are a very particular symbol as well. Of course, they have a very functional and specific purpose, which is to protect your eyes from the sun's rays. But it can also be something that protects your soul from being seen through your eyes, uh, from somebody else's gaze. And of course, they also serve as the perfect accessory for that perfect pose for that perfect post on the gram. <laughs> <laughs> so what we're, what we're seeing here, silence is two pictures of a bicycle and a BMW. Oh. Disclaimer, I am a Mercedes-Benz fan, but not yet. <laughs> <laughs> These could just be images of modes of transport. Or there are images, the one may be, uh, may tell us a story about somebody's relationship to health or someone's relationship to poverty, depending on where you live. The other may tell us a bit about somebody's ego, their relationship to money. And where I come from, the worst and the most arrogant drivers are BMW drivers. <laughs> <laughs> I know a lot of people from Johannesburg would agree with me. So it's a, it's a status symbol. Here, here you have just products that serve a very functional purpose, but in the world that we live in, they tell us something about the people who make the choice to associate themselves with this particular brand. And like I mentioned, marketers have made a ton of money in doing this, in being able to craft a compelling story for their brand, being able to know and have a good sense of what the stories of their prospective customers are, you know, their, their targeted markets are, and trying to make sure that they effectively align those two stories. And many brands do that, do that very well. 
and we do the same. So let's just briefly touch on uh, this sh shift in need, and I think Jinjin um, has, of course, spoken to that quite a bit. There's a move from uh, traditional media, reliance on traditional media. They used to own stories. They used to be the authority on what's happening in the world, but of course, that has changed. Why it's changed? As a result of this pocket-sized supercomputer. At any point in a given moment, if you take a picture now, you post it, you've told a story about this particular moment in this particular state, in this city, at this, at this time. There's of course also a shift from only a few people who decide what content is relevant at any given po uh, po uh, point to all of us essentially being content creators. All of us are in fact storytellers. What has been the impact of the shift? Well, we are starting to see more of ourselves in stories because we are creating the stories. So if I'm not seeing myself in something, I'm not gonna hype it up on social media. I'm not I'm unlikely to tell anybody about it. But if you obviously watching the news on television, for example, you have very little control on whether or not yourself in some form is reflected through that. The pool of content is growing exponentially. Content is coming from all over the place. Of course, there is a danger in that as well, where you also have multiple sources, where journalism, of course, as, as many of us are in the room, you have to make sure that you fact check, you have to trust the source of, uh, of the particular story. And we know of uh, many cases where people have been caught, right? Where you just retweet something because it's hot, or the journalist or the editor doesn't do the work to ensure that the content has been um, verified and you know, people are defamed or it just happens to be live. And, and of course, uh, there have been a number of, of, of videos pertaining to, to Africa, perhaps uh, to do with some lion or, or some hippo somewhere. And people share these videos as if they are facts. And in fact, they're not. So of course, we do have to be very careful, particularly as, as, as professional storytellers. It's connectivity on steroids. And I was debating with myself when I kind of put that there. But, should I call it connectivity or should it just be interactivity on steroids? Because connectivity suggests that I know a bit more about you than your profile picture, right? I, I actually don't just know that you may have four kittens. I kind of know um, what their names are. You know, I have, I have a sense of what's going on in, in your life. And that's the danger really of the fact that we have all of these platforms where we can connect. Everybody's on Insta, Twitter, uh, Facebook, TikTok, all right, all, all, all sorts of things that, that people are doing, but are we really connecting? I'm mean, going to ask you, what do you feel about that? Are we connecting? Are we? No, no there's a clear no. And at the back of an older person here, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let me hear your thoughts, Matthew. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, part of the connectivity question is you're presenting a version of yourself right so are you really connecting i don't know it depends on how truthful you are mm -hmm. right right well, thank, thank you for sharing then of course another impact of all of this it's plenty fun it really is you saw those 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 are uh, at tiktok uh, uh, videos we're having we're having a ton of fun with it and i think um, in a world where there's a there's a lot of not so fun things that are going on the fact that we're able to play around um, on social media and play around with people you may never meet in your life is fantastic. But this is my beautiful continent um, of Africa. There are 54 countries. I am from one of them. That's me over there. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm from South Africa. I kid you not, I have had somebody say to me, oh, South Africa, is that like South of Africa? <laughs> 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 so I thought, should it not be obvious? <laughs> Let me make it obvious. But I'm, 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 I'm just trying to, to state the point here that it's, uh, it's, it's vast. We have an almost 2 billion population. However, some of the trends that I will speak to, it's certainly a trend that you're seeing all over the continent. You can apply it to uh, particularly the, the, ma the major cities on, on the continent. However, the sensible thing, if you want to understand the dynamics in each country, you would have to look at all 54, at each, at each country on its own merits and understand what, what the dynamics there are. So I work in that particular region, that's where I live, that's where I was born, but uh, with aspirations to work on the rest of the continent and, and uh, some of the trends that can be applied there. So traditional um, oral storytelling is, a, I mean, it's a very key part of, of who we are as a people. It's an ancient practice in African culture. One, one in fact that still, still exists to date 
it is and was a way to pass on knowledge, history, tradition, um, some lessons as well for young people. It was also a means to commune with the gods and nature when uh, people perhaps uh, want, want to be able to, to teach the young ones as to what's happening when there's a really when you know change of weather or trying to understand the plants that this is you know this is the time of day when we plant and so on. That really was the purpose of it, including of course the entertainment value that, that there was. It's always a, commun a communal experience, so it would happen around the fire. Um, you'd sit around and there'd be a storyteller, somebody who's very animated, who's entertaining, who's, who's knowledgeable, but is able to interact with the audience. They told in a repetitive, melodic, and interactive way, um, which then makes it easy to remember. I'm sure it's something that you did when you were children, but you can do it with, with adults as well, right, if you apply the same um, the same way of, of teaching particular stories. Modern forms of African storytelling, very similar. Um, they are a reflection of the times. We speak a lot, uh, I don't know if you, if you, if you have engaged um, African history um, quite a bit in, in particular, but I speak about the South African case where um, when we were fighting apartheid, we had a lot of artists and creatives exiled outside um, of, of the country, exiled mm -hmm. on the rest of the continent, and many of them exiled in the U.S. as well. But they were key in spreading the message. So you had the politicians who were doing the work of, of being politicians, of being struggle activists. That was the one way they were doing it. But it really was the artists, jazz musicians such as Miriam Makeba, um, <laughs> who's, who's late. You have Huma Sigela, who we lost just um, last year, a celebrated jazz figure, celebrated African artists who were able to carry the message and reflect at the times. And that is happening right now as well. We have hip hop artists who are very popular, but are reflecting the times today um, as well. And there really are too many to mention. And you see that across, across the continent, there are multiple forms, music, theater, film, um, again, a communal experience, but of a different nature. We don't necessarily see each other or are in the same space, but, but again, it's a shared experience. The stories travel further, they're repetitive, formulate, and, and are memorable as well. So it hasn't shifted, it's just the, perhaps the style, the content itself has shifted, but the idea is the same. Um, and, 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 and for me, I think what's important is to reflect the times in our job as well as professional storytellers. There are people who get paid to tell stories, I'll put it bluntly. That's, we're fortunate enough to be those people. Ours is to ensure that we are authentic and adequately reflecting the times. So three, three trends in Africa that are, are critical, not just for ourselves as media professionals and storytellers, but just really across the board. So you may perhaps uh, want to be a mining tycoon in the future or an automobile tycoon. These trends are currently shaping how everything functions and happens on the African continent. Firstly, youth. We are a young continent. We are unbelievably young, wonderfully young. 40% of our population are under the age of 19 years. Any 19 year olds in the room? <laughs> For real? Wow. So 40% of our population are like that dude. <laughs> Other stats will say to you 60% are under the age of 24 years old. 40% of our population is very young. So this is why when we talk about how it's time for the pensioners who are occupying the highest offices on our continent, that it's time for them to go, this is why it's time for them to go, right? They're in their 70s, 80s. Robert Mugabe was in his 90s until last year. And he's leading people who are teenagers? Are you kidding me? Our president, we have a new president, his name is uh, uh, Cyril Ramaphosa. He's just um, gotten into office. He's 65 years old. We call this a new dawn. What? <laughs> he's 65 years old. He should have taken his pension. He should be home enjoying his buffaloes. And he owns buffaloes because he's wealthy. So you should be having you should be having a good time, and we should be having younger people who are leading the continent. So it's not just to say, oh yeah, the continent is young, but there's a very real need for there to for, for, for there to be real transformation. Of course, what this means is that this little kid right here is gonna need a job at some point. 
he is gonna want to make sure that he can get a quality education it doesn't just limit him to wherever he, he, he is born, and I think he's from Kenya. He wants to be able to get the adequate education that he can work all over the continent or all over the world. And when you have old people, and I can say that because we have no old people in this room. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> Very old, oh my goodness. Well, thank you for being here. But when you have, you have people who are not in touch with the people they're meant to be leading, we are going to have burial crises on the continent. Rapid urbanization, that is happening um, quite, quite, uh, quite a bit. You're seeing it in South Africa, in Kenya, you're seeing it in Ghana, um, Nigeria. Um, certainly people are moving away from the rural areas, they're moving into peri-urban areas, they're moving into the cities. Again, they want opportunities, they want jobs, they want work, they want education. Not enough of that is happening at the level that it should be. But Africa's economy is almost growing at nothing. We're at 1.2%. Mm. We have other countries who are slightly at five or six, um, um, seven percent as well, if you look for the East, but they're coming off from a very low base. So that will drop as well going forward, right? That growth needs to be crazy so that we can meet the people, meet the needs of the people who are moving into, into, into the cities and the people who, of course, are very young. By 2035, we will have the largest workforce. At this point, it's projected that we will have the second largest population, but we will have the largest workforce. That essentially means all the Asians will either be too young to work or too old to work. So we will have the largest workforce population. Again, I repeat, the need then for us to be at the, at, at the, at the point where people are able to work so that doesn't lead to the other social ills is, is one that is, that, that is urgent. It's, it's urgent. And sometimes you listen to, to our leaders and you, and you realize that they don't, they don't understand the urgency because politicians think about the next election. They don't think about the fact that you know, 20, 30 years time, are we gonna have all of these people who are children now, who are teenagers, are they going to be able to work and contribute to the economy? So if you take nothing else from, from my conversation um, with you today, just take these three things. Like these are the three things that are shaping everything on the continent. They're shaping education, commerce, they are, are shaping, in fact, they're shaping politics as well. It's just happening a lot slower than what it could potentially do. We're a young, um, we're a young uh, population, we're urbanizing rapidly, and we will have the largest workforce in the future. So if you, you know, have a ton of, make a ton of money um, in, 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 a, in the future, call me up. <laughs> this, is where, this is where you're gonna get um, you're going to get um, the people you need to help you make that work happen. That's why we are, we are the final frontier, right? There's a real battle for not just Africa's resources, but Africa's human resources as well. We had the West there for the longest time, but now China's like, hey, we've been trying to get in here, and they are there. And we're going to have another conversation about, about what <laughs> the impact um, of them being there and, and what that has brought. It certainly has brought a lot of opportunity. Um, and, th and, that is, and that is what we're saying. So how can we as storytellers leverage this particular opportunity? Well, let's talk about just voice, right? In, in when you are capturing and telling your stories, who, who are you centering? Are you centering the voices of Africans or are you still telling African stories from the perspective of a non-African, whether you're a Westerner, whether you're somebody who comes from the Middle East or, or Asia, are you centering those voices you have to center those voices. If you're not, no one is listening to you. No one is listening to you. So, you know, you have the likes of Reuters, um, Africa, you have Al Jazeera, you have um, BBC Africa, and you're seeing a shift that they are also re realizing that as much as you have these Brits with wonderful accents who have a sense of the continent, they are not who we want to hear or see. And they're starting to, to get more people from the continent to actually do the real work of, of, of telling these stories. You have to connect through language, right? That's, that's a huge factor. Of course, it's an opportunity and a challenge as well. We are a very diverse continent, but depending on where you are, um, if you know, so what, for example, if you know French in West Africa and some parts of Central Africa, you're good to go. If you speak Kiswahili, you're good to go in West Africa and parts of Southern Africa. Um, if you speak Amharic, like Ade does, Ar Arabic, like um, Dalia does in North Africa, you're good to go. Um, in, uh, in, in Southern Africa, usually with English, actually, yeah, with English you can move around. However, if you speak 
Isi Zulu, which is, which is the language I speak, that's, that's my mother tongue. It's very similar to other languages such as um, Debele, um, which is spoken in South African parts of Zimbabwe. You have, uh, um, uh, you have Shona as well, which is quite similar, so you understand that it's close as well, which is um, on the, on the eastern, east, eastern parts of, of the country. So these languages are quite similar. In fact, if you do speak um, the, one of the languages under the Nguni family, you can actually even move further up into Central Africa where you can communicate with a lot of people. So that's also a way for you to be able to navigate um, the continent itself. Ask, am I, am, I being, uh, am I being authentic? And you probably have to do this with, with each thing that, that you relay, because something may be shocking for you because you're not from the environment, but for other people it's like, yeah, but that's, that's the norm. Why are you getting excited about it? Where in fact you could focus on other things and that's, what, that's really what, what you should be talking about. What issues are you covering? There are just some things that we don't care about um, because they just, they just don't matter to us. So make sure that the issues are relevant and they pack a punch because it's a competition for the audience's attention, right? People can do all sorts of other things. If they're going to engage your con content, make sure that it packs a punch. Objectivity is a myth. We can debate this later, but it's a, it's a, it's a myth. <laughs> and you're seeing that a lot, I think, at this time. Maybe it'll change in the future, perhaps, right? Maybe we'll go back to a place where we're able to step back, step back from the edges. But right now, when things are, are happening as, as they are, to kind of sit back and not call it out um, as, as you should, still gather the facts. But this is something you should call out. And, 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 and when people are, have the privilege of, Again, telling stories on the content. If you're not doing this, are you really doing the work of, um, of, of informing people? And that also motivates the next point. Call it out. Call it out. And there's plenty of that. And the great thing of the space that we're in, once you kind of break out of what is news, how you present the news, you can do all of this. And that's where the conversation is right now in in most parts of the continent. It's happening in the likes of the, in, in, in Nairobi. If you guys follow um, some Kenyans on Twitter, my goodness, they lay in on their leaders and they should. We do the same. We lay in on our leaders. Our problem though is that we get offended when other people do it. It's like, you're not lying, but he's kind of still our guy. So let us kind of pull him up. <laughs> But, but you, you, don't, you don't get a say. It's a very, it's a very South African thing. We, we, we become patriotic in the strangest of ways. So when our president, I mean, he was at, in Davos just the other week, when he says something at home that we disagree with, we're going hard. He said the same thing outside and we're like, okay, yeah, we hear, we hear where he was going. I guess maybe he was just wanting to make sure that um, we, we, we protect our own, even though when, we, when he comes back home, we, we rectify, we rectify all of it. Kenyans do none of it, they're going hard. And I think that's what we should adopt um, in the future. With a clear victim, support them. Um, and there are many cases back home where that is the case. You know, right in Kenya recently, um, as well, you, you had a terror attack um, where people are still having debates about who's right, who's wrong, um, debates about whether or not, um, where there's a clear injustice, people are like, hmm, but is it really an, an injustice? We sometimes wonder what's really what, what's happening to um, so our humanity, um, when, when there's clear injustice, but you're unable to, to call it out. Platforms are huge. Radio is king um, on the continent. Uh, this is still the best way to reach um, most people. So uh, people who are living in the rural areas haven't quite urbanized as yet. It's also still king because data costs are high on the continent. So it's great to be online, but at some point that runs out and you need to get more and, and um, uh, if you're not working, that becomes um, difficult to do. How do you solve for that? Make content accessible offline. That's what they're doing in terms of education in particular, where they're giving learners tablets. Um, but of course, they need to make that content accessible online because of electricity issues. So that's going to load shedding right now. Power issues, you can't, um, you know, you can't charge your device. Um, uh, data costs may be very high, but we still need to be able to, uh, to move forward and grow as a people. Of course, grow the social media activity. The trajectory, it's, it's, it's going up, but it's, it's, it's really not at the levels or num anywhere close to the numbers that, um, that you like to see in places such as China. And of course, collaboration between creatives is, is just powerful. It goes a long way. You access a lot more people who are not bothered by the news channels, but are more interested in what their favorite you know, rap artist or singer is doing. That's, those are the people um, that, that they're likely to follow. 
Just finally, some great um, Africans that you may already know. Chimama Ngozi Adichie, she's a Nigerian author. Um, Beyonce featured her on, 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 um, on one of her songs. Um, if, if, you, you know, if there are people who really are, uh, who really capture the, the, the energy um, and, the, and, and the sentiment of what's happening with young Africans right now, um, Chimamanda is, is, one of those, is one of those people. Bobby Wine, who is a Ugandan musician, politician, very wealthy um, um, Ugandan, he tried to challenge the president of Uganda, um, Yoweri Museveni, who has been in power for, um, uh, he was slightly less, less than Mugabe, so it's about 35 years, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. he, yeah, the, 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 the pensioners or so about, yeah. Uh, Museveni from, from Uganda is, is one of those. Bobby Wine tried to, to challenge him in the elections. Of course, he used his music to reach people, but they, they I mean, I think there were, there were two concerts that the government intervened and stopped. They were like, those are not happening um, because, because of his club. So here's somebody who's, who's using his, his, his platform um, to reach the masses, and that is what is threatening much older people who um, still want to hang on to power. DJ Black Coffee is a South African DJ. Do you guys know him? He is huge. He's been to Coachella. Um, really um, a, 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 an export um, that, that we are very proud of. But he certainly has taken the brand of house music. We, we really are the capital of, of house music. He's been able to do incredible things across, across the globe. We're going to start seeing more of these people. And this is really where um, the stories about the continent are being, are being run from, they're being dominated by individuals such as these. Thank you very much. Mm. Thank you, Simon. We've got time, I think, for just a couple of quick questions about the storytellers in Africa, especially South Africa. Who's got one? Mark Haas. Professor Haas. Fascinating conversation. Great. So you mentioned that modern storytelling in Africa formulaic. Can you describe that formula? So, so the, the formula is, is essentially the same, at, um, right, as, as the traditional storytelling. But if I think about poetry, for example, um, I, I, and I don't know how, I suppose spoken word is, is, is a thing in, in many parts, but spoken word artists <coughs> are, are, are trending quite, quite extensively. And also, it's just the way that they deliver it. I actually had, I wanted to show um, a, a particular artist who, who does that, but I, I ran out of time. But there's there's a way that they that they deliver it, right? That is is growing on people. Um, you're actually finding it being used in schools as well, um, more often. So it's kind of getting into the minds of, of, of younger people, um, but kind of not wanting to feel like you're teaching them something, but you but you are, right? You're trying you're trying to get them to um, to to think about issues in a particular way. So spoken word is becoming more more formal, but there's a way to do it. If you do it any other way, if you kind of stand in front of the classroom and read a poem. It's just, it's just not, not going to resonate. So just how, how, they, uh, you know, how, how they interact with the students, how they, 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 they put the material out there. It's, 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 um, it's quite exciting, actually. And of course, there's, there's the hip hop as well, um, where depending on the language that's, that you use, there's also a way that they do it. So your Sutu speaking people, Botswana speaking people in Botswana and the Sutu as well, they also have, have, have a style if you will, that, that you run with. And if, if you break from that, then it's not, it's not, it's not that any longer. So people kind of stick to that. Good question. Yes, final one back here. <laughs> Why you think, does anybody else have one? Oh, I just got it, I just got it. Okay, came back, good. Right. So 19 year old is great at sharing things on Facebook, but how does having such a young population affect your voter turnout and political action? So there's, there's a lot of um, voter apathy, but that apathy, for the most part, um, is, is as a result of the people who are on the ballot just not reflecting society. But I mean, you know, more, more advanced democracies as well kind of reach that point as well, where people are just, it's a problem that you experience here um, as well. But we're seeing young opposition parties, so in South Africa, it's the economic freedom fighters, where I'm sure the average age is like 35. And those guys are making a lot of noise Young people are responding to them. So we go to a general election in May, on the 8th of May. Um, it's going to be very interesting what the turnout is there because they are hitting the right notes. They use the right platforms. They have a spokesperson who can sing. So they sing all these revolutionary songs. We had 
protest for free higher education. So you have those students who are in line and in tune with, with, with these guys. So there's, there's an energy, but definitely the, the, the apathy is, is real and we'll have to see what, what happens in, um, in the next couple of months. We appreciate the energy of these two great speakers who sparkled. Some of you may have additional questions for them. You can come up afterwards and ask that. Next week, we hope you'll be back here in this very room. We will look at uh, shattering the journalistic global glass ceiling with the day from Ethiopia, Dalia from Egypt, and Lillian from China, talking about issues of women and empowerment in roles in the newsroom. So we hope you'll continue the conversation uh, even as we give them one final round of applause. Oh, no, it's in one
have a friend who's got a, what? I don't care the visit to visit because I don't have a companion. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I've got a friend who I don't have that on. His sister-in-law has a house in Mexico. And so he's down there now. We're not moving. Saturday, I'm so on Sunday, I'm going down there. All right.